Hi, this is Professor Chad McGuire, and welcome to this video lecture focusing on offshore resource development, part of our ocean policy and law course, uh, but also for general interest. So here we're looking at ocean uh, offshore resource development and focusing on state and federal rights in the United States. In this section, we begin to move our exploration of ocean policy and law beyond the coastline and into offshore areas of the ocean. Until now, most of our focus has been on the coastline, and we have looked at legal frameworks impacting public and private rights in the coastal zone, and much of that review has focused on values associated with property rights to the shoreline, the physical space, as well as rights uh, of access to the shoreline, both public and private. So as we focused on values associated with property rights relative to the land itself, the physical land, uh, we focused on how those rights and how those human interactions with most of the coastline um, had relative importance vis-a-vis -vis each other based on that physical land. Where's, you know, where's private land, where's public land, that sort of thing. But now we begin to explore a different set of values, one of ownership rights to the resources contained within the ocean itself. So rather than looking at the physical land space and thinking about property rights and access rights, we're now going to take a look at those property rights that move into the ocean water, submerged land, and look at some of the ownership rights to the resource contained within these areas. Our focus um, is on competing government rights. For now, between coastal states and federal rights and ocean resources, we'll focus on two aspects of these competing rights, two specific acts, aspects. Property rights to the physical space of the ocean and ownership rights to the resources contained within that physical space. So we can take a look here and see specifically um, as a summary, our early work up until this point has really focused on at maximum this area, the uplands and these physical spaces and relative rights related to these physical spaces, uplands, line of vegetation, dry sand and wet sand. And we discussed earlier that private rights in some coastal states can extend all the way to the low tide mark where the wet sand is that intertidal zone and in many other states coastal states in the united states those private ownership rights extend to the dry sand or the high tide line uh, so there's some but we know that um this there's a high degree of uh of of property rights attached to these upland areas where the ocean touches the land um, whether that's at low tide or high tide and certainly as we move landward we all understand that there's a high degree of property rights at stake and then ownership interests are pretty uh, pretty clear our laws are pretty well defined about how ownership is defined what it means to own land and also the things that exist within that land, uh, what are private rights, what are the government or public rights within those spaces and what are public spaces or public rights within those spaces. But now we're moving into this area where we, we begin at this, what we'll just call it the low tide line where the water always touches, for the most part always touches. Um, the land to uh, ocean, uh, moving away from the land, so consistently submerged land. And we're looking at these, um, we can look down here, uh, at these uh, relative issues here specifically right now is state ownership rights and federal ownership rights between the state and federal government and where they exist and where they interact and what it means uh, to interact. And we did a little bit of this um, in our last uh, set of materials where we looked at the Coastal Zone Management Act and we looked at state rights, uh, federal government incentivizing states to develop management plans and what that meant. Uh, and then um, once states had done these coastal management plans, what rights were they given over state interests in coastal areas, including state waters, and uh, you know uh, what it meant in terms of um, the federal government prioritizing what it wants to do in its in its waters and federal waters um, relative to state. So we're going to get into a little more definition and understanding of these this notion of state ownership of submerged land, where that comes from, where it ends, and then federal ownership and where these rights. So one of the things that we should understand 
uh, or come to understand at least when we look at the legal frameworks, we always have to relate them back to the policy environment because this is where we're looking at the larger policy picture and implicate, I'm sorry, implications. So we should come to understand that uh, policy is a dynamic and ever evolving, uh, meaning that a change in preferences off, often follows new information. And this is particularly true when new information leads to opportunities and motivates new policy directions. We can see this if we just focus on uh, the water here. A clear example is represented in the history of state and federal rights in ocean waters. And here we have an example of uh, just defining uh, these state uh, state waters uh, and then federal interests and then maybe uh, beyond federal interests, international waters, just to get a sense of how we divide up in terms of zones uh, different, uh, but we're focusing mainly here on uh, state and uh, federal interactions. So one of the ways to look at this is as technology advances, uh, uh, technological advances have increased our capacity to reach and extract resources within the oceans. Actors, both, pu both public and private, have come forward to claim rights to these resources. And from the public perspective, coastal states and the federal government have been at odds with one another on how best to share these new opportunities. This is historically true. So you can imagine a time when humans really didn't have the capacity to do much in the water. So they were very closely related to the coastline and in terms of being able to access resources, they were very limited to, let's say, coastal, at most coastal fishing and maybe collecting of, um, you know, uh, organisms and in, in, intertidal zones, you think of like clams and some other things for food and, uh, but very limited in our ability to move into the water and actually um, uh, locate, identify what we would call resources uh, in the water, and then to be able to actually do something about that. You can think of oil and gas, for example, where are large oil and gas deposits under our submerged lands um, off of coastal United States. Before we started using oil and gas and as a, a means of, you know, producing energy, for example, um, before we did that, I, I I would uh, argue that we wouldn't even consider or contextualize the oil and gas as a resource we, because it wasn't it had no viable use for humans. So we can think about how our advancing, if we want to call it that, but as we advance over time technologically, as we have as we develop new capacities and new understandings and new way of doing things, we can see how that not only um, helps us to identify things like oil and gas, offshore oil and gas as a resource. And then that uh, advancement also provides us with the means in which we can actually access those resources. And this is important to know because, you know, what ends up happening is that um, in early times, we can think that uh, we're very much uh, in terms of our use of resources, we're very much limited to near shore. Uh, and it's only until um, as we have this advancement that we can be begin moving more offshore and accessing things that we finding what exists there and then um, determining whether or not there's something that we want to, um, you know, that that's worth our time and energy uh, in going there and, and trying to, you know, uh, you think of these offshore oil rigs, for example, an incredibly complicated technology of drilling underwater, drilling through the water, getting through the water, getting to a uh, bedrock and drilling uh, in deep sea areas, and then, you know, maintaining all of this equipment and capacity, and then being able to access things and extract the things that you want. There's all kinds of neat things that you can, some of you might know this, some of you not, but certainly, of course, commercial fisheries, we've moved further and further offshores, uh, deep water species have become viable target species. There's also things like, especially today, when you think of like battery technology and other things like lithium, and there are these things called polymetallic nodules that exist in deep waters. And these are just basically, they're just that, they're polymetallic nodules, but they, can, they maintain a lot of rare earth elements. And these are things that are becoming very valuable because we're using them more and more, these rare earth elements, uh, in the production of, of technologically advanced uh, things that we uh, use that we never used to use. So as time goes on and, you know, as the uh, technology to actually access these things um, gets better and gets cheaper, while the rarity of what these things are and, you know, the, uh, the demand for them goes up, 
uh, then you know you can see where we pass a point where it's viable, becomes economically viable to go and identify these things that we know exist um, and identify them as target things, things we want to go after. And of course, when we do that, we have to consider the effects. We have to say, look, as we're doing this, is it just uh, just accessing this resource? Is that it, or does it have an effect on other things that we care about? And we. So climate change is an obvious candidate for counterpositioning oil and gas, offshore oil and gas development, because we're moving carbon from you know deep seabeds uh, under geological you know stored basically in our below our Earth's crust and moving it out of that stored area and you know and utilizing it for a number of purposes. And of course, technological advancements today tell us that offshore wind uh, is a viable candidate. So we oil and gas is technically um, a lot of that's been used for. Um, means and modes of uh, generating energy, you know, utilizing the energy stored in those hydrocarbons and in a variety of ways uh, to utilize energy, transition that to some kind of energy that we want, whether that's a gasoline product, uh, kerosene or some jet fuel product, or as a means of generating electricity and commercial electricity production. We know that we can use tides now, we can use the movement of tides uh, to generate electricity because we, we have new technologies, we certainly can harness the wind using windmills and other technologies, um, advanced windmills and other technologies that sit offshore to harvest a lot of wind that occurs in our offshore areas. Uh, there's a, a multitude of ways that we're learning how, uh, what are right viable resources in our offshore areas, what they are, um, you know, we're defining them and we're defining and, and exploring new ones. And then as we do this, uh, not only come up with ideas of should it should we access this now that we've defined it as a resource, but if we access it, how does it affect other resources? Does it affect other resources? Certainly oil and gas, the Deepwater Horizon, Exxon Valdez is a, 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 a an older example, but there are many examples where you can have through um, oil and gas development and exploration offshore that can create really significant problems for other things, including the ecosystems. You know, when you have an oil spill, for example, um, that can have a significant impact on the ecosystem near term and longer term. Uh, and you could just, uh, there's a real importance to that ecosystem that we've discussed, just maintaining the integrity of that ecosystem. But there's also the, you know, there's a lot of commercial activity. So if we're in the Gulf of Mexico and and we really, you know, shrimp are a really important industry. Uh, the, you know, uh, target fish, uh, target species like shrimp or other uh, fish, commercial fish species, even recreational uh, fish species uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, they're all impacted and affected. All of those um, resources are impacted, even tourism, even just people that like to swim in the water. We didn't used to do that many, many years ago. That wasn't considered something that you know humans had as a strong preference, uh, just recreational swimming, recreational diving, recreational boating, uh, recreational, you know, everything that we like to do uh, in the water. These are, we're using that water as a resource for that purpose. And we can think of other things that we do or choose to do or might choose to do in the water that might impact those uh, you know, what we consider priorities. So it's real important. So as technological advances have increased, our capacity to reach and extract resources within the ocean have come forward uh, and public and private uh, actors have come forward to uh, claim the rights to those resources. Um, and so as no, and from the public perspective, excuse me, uh, coastal states and the federal government have been at odds with one another how best to share these new opportunities. As noted in the primary text, um, the discovery of oil deposits just offshore coastal states, particularly California, this is back and we'll go over this uh, in the next uh, slide or two, open new opportunities for revenue generation. As such, both the federal government and coastal states had new reasons to claim ownership rights over the ocean. Both the federal government and the state, both public entities wanted to develop new policy directions that included a claim of entitlement over marine resources. The question, as we have come to see, is what impact legal frameworks have on competing federal and state claims to the same ocean resources? And adding a historical political context to this question, how did these claims ultimately resolve to bring us to our current understanding of state and federal rights? essentially shared government of coastal resources. This is the larger policy question. So as we explore the historical tidelands controversy and then discuss current issues in the development of ocean resources, consider the role legal frameworks play in this discussion and then overlay on this consideration the ways in which policy directions can be taken to sidestep the law in certain instances. 
Collectively, the historical part of this section will help us better understand policy options today with regards to offshore resources. So it's important to know how we got to the point where we have state waters and federal waters and what's generated these what, what's generated the notion of state rights, federal rights, what, ha what has happened and what happens today when they may come in conflict with each other, meaning that states identify resources or priorities that are different than what the federal government does in terms of these ocean resources that overlap effectively, especially the resources within them or the activities, the effects of the activities overlap. And then, you know, as we've as we continue to develop as a society, our technology, our priorities, our preferences, our values, beliefs, and norms, as they all continue to develop, what are the uh, what, what does it look like looking forward? And that's really what policy is, right? Policy is about not only the decisions we're making today or the decisions we've made yesterday, but what are we thinking about doing tomorrow? So that influences and impacts the choices we make today. So in terms of the Tidelands controversy, let's uh, do a quick timeline overview here. So the Thailand's controversy is a prime example of the interactions between policy and law as information changes. Once it became clear that the oceans contain valuable resources, and importantly, that those resources could be extracted, uh, that the value from the resources could be captured, governments began to develop policies supporting the capturing of that value. What is interesting though at this time is the legal basis for assigning the rights to the resources between governments, state and federal, was not wholly settled. Thus, the lack of legal clarity provided a rules void that allowed both coastal states and the federal government to claim ownership rights. So at this time, before we started using the water in any meaningful way, whether that's to use the water itself or extract the things that were inside of it, before then, there was no real need to have a lot of rules, to have a lot of uh, claims. Uh, be, uh, rules, Laws are effectively rules, and they're meant to create order out of you know relative chaos. Uh, and so that when you don't have a lot of it's important from a policy standpoint to understand that when it, it tends to be the case that when humans aren't using something um, or aren't thinking clearly about using something, uh, then they don't really spend a lot of time and energy. We Sometimes we call this the issue attention cycle, but that's certainly uh, laws tend to follow, you know, new activity or follow our evolution. You know, we, we develop laws uh, to manage behaviors after the behaviors uh, become apparent, you know, we're always trying to catch up. The law is always trying to catch up with human activity and um, human advancement, if you want to call it that. So, you know, what ends up happening is that um, through the Tidelands controversy, we can see a great case study in this, where we start understanding that there are things in the ocean that we might want, and then we have the capacity to get them. And then there becomes this sort of like rush to determine who owns what, who has priority over what, that kind of thing. So for our purposes, we can identify the policy implica implications excuse me, of unsettled law on a subject. When the law is unsettled, the rights between the parties are unknown. While lack of clarity on respective rights can create policy opportunities, windows where policy can be developed to take advantage of the ambiguity, the lack of clarity can also make it difficult to discern clear policy directions. Understanding this point is an important part of understanding the relationship between law and policy. While legal frameworks like constitutional protections, for example, can seem to limit policy options in many circumstances, those same frameworks can also provide important guidance on policy directions, essentially helping one discern the validity of different options. So here's our Tidelands controversy in terms of a, uh, a short sort of history to understand exactly what's going on. So in between the 16 and 1700s, colonies, let's call that that, at least this is the European history, uh, colonies and then states inherited title to coastal waters, submerged lands from the monarch, uh, per common law traditions. And in part, we've noted, we've noted in the past that England inherited a lot of its common law traditions, its early traditions of law from Roman law, uh, Roman law traditions. So What's important to remember here is by the time that we came over, as colonists came over, we, but colonists came over uh, to the United States, uh, European colonists, um, they brought forward with them, of course, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the English common law. And at that time, you know, the monarch, which owned the colonies, which owned all of the, you know, property that wasn't specifically given to others um, by the monarch, uh, owned all submerged land. And that developed from Roman common law traditions, uh, 
uh, Roman law traditions. So um, understanding there that the monarch or the, you know, what, what would be considered the, you know, the head of government, for example, the monarch in England um, would be the owner of submerged land. So we we, we bring forward that, that tradition. Um, so in the 17 and 1800s, after independence, U.S. colonies, which all, you know, they were colonies, then territories, then ultimately states, and whether they existed at the time, the original 13 colonies, or they were territories later after independence uh, that then ultimately became states uh, that were in coastal areas. Think of something outside of New England, for example, that's a coastal state today. We're given the same right to submerge land as early colonies. So if the early colonies had uh, inherited through common law tradition the right to those submerged lands uh, within its waters, uh, within you know, its, its proximate area, if they gained ownership rights, those colonies that then became states, you know, uh, then um, the same thing happened for other coastal states when they became states. Uh, so that's something we have on the law called the equal footing doctrine, but it's important to know this because it helps us understand, okay, why do coastal states or why, did, why does the government um, have ownership rights, right? Uh, whether that's state government, coastal state government, or federal government, why do they have ownership rights in these submerged land in, in ocean areas? In the 1930s, and this is going back to the California that we discussed before, oil begins to be discovered offshore in many coastal states. Those coastal states began leasing and gaining income from leasing. So right away, when as we start looking to oil as a major uh, form of resource, uh, as a new, the new uh, oil gold rush, uh, so to speak, it certainly happened uh, and moved across the lands in the 18, late 1800s and the early 1900s. Um, but as we moved through the land areas, we also then started um, near coastal waters, we started discovering offshore near coast, right near the coast, uh, that there was valuable resources, particularly oil. And, you know, they started pumping oil. Uh, and the coastal states jumped on this and said, look, okay, private individuals, companies, etc., that are uh, out here trying to, you know, to do this, we're going to, uh, you know, we're, we're the owners of the resources, because we own the land, the submerged, we own the ocean and the, and the land underneath that ocean. So we're going to lease this to you and we're going to gain income from this process. And coastal states immediately started taking advantage of this and claimed effectively ownership at, a, at the exclusion of the federal government. Remember, back then, um, just moving just to offshore was about as good as we could get that. We didn't have the technological capacity to go far offshore and do any oil and gas development um, back then. So it was near shore. It was all very closely related to the shoreline. In 1947, as a result of the federal government really saying, whoa, wait a second, that's a lot of money, that's a lot of resource that you're claiming these states, you know, we should be claiming this. And there was a controversy between who owns the submerged land right off the coastline? Is it the, is it the states or the federal government? And um, they basically, the federal government sued the states. And this uh, lawsuit went from federal court all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court, which actually has original jurisdiction when there are questions between states, for example, state suing states or federal government suing state, um, sometimes. Uh, so the U.S. Supreme Court in 1947 uh, decided that the federal government has a paramount right over states and submerged lands. It actually said that the federal government owns all submerged lands or if there's a pecking order or prioritization that the federal government has priority over states, coastal states, um, and submerged lands and the resources in those submerged lands. And they identified the US Constitution, particularly the Commerce Clause, and also national defense um, as being reasons. And those, by the way, um, those reasons still exist. Um, today, I want to be clear on that. There's, you know, when there's navigation, there's, there's a number of uh, constitutional, um, clearly identified areas in the Constitution where the federal government trumps states' rights for certain things for uh, uh, in terms of um, access to coastal submerged lands for certain reasons. But in 1947, they were saying that, look, um, for almost all reasons, um, they have paramount right over um, the resources, everything contained in these near shore coastal areas, including oil, for example. And so as such, the federal government has the right to regulate resources seaward of the low tide line. It has primary, um, you know, uh, supreme rights over these resources. And for the federal government, the what was important there was, hey, we can do the oil and gas leasing, and we can uh, gain income from that leasing rather than the coastal states, at least at that time. So as you can imagine, coastal states, and this is all detailed in uh, and sort of, uh, well, it's all provided in great detail in the readings, uh, coastal states weren't very happy about this. Uh, and so in 1953, um, 
Congress. Remember, Congress is made up from those individuals from states. And so, you know, and the state interest is important to senators and representatives uh, that represent those coastal states. So U.S. Congress passed the Submerged Land Act, uh, overruling the 1947 U.S. Supreme Court opinion in part, of course, can't under overrule a constitutional, but uh, in granting states full ownership of resources contained in submerged lands, uh, so I'm sorry, but up to three miles from the shoreline. So the three mile limit that we get for coastal states ownership over the resources, particularly like oil, gas, et cetera, um, but other uh, things as well, um, that um, comes from a federal law, the Submerged Lands Act that was passed in 1953. It doesn't mean this law, remember our hierarchy of laws, this doesn't mean that you know con uh, coastal states have um, unique authority over everything that occurs within three nautical miles, that the federal government still has constitutional rights of commerce, national defense, navigation, etc. A number of uh, things um, that was part of the U.S. Supreme Court opinion, just making sure, you know, enumerating those rights. So the federal government still has a lot of say, just like it does in, 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 in state territories as well. Uh, federal law is the supreme law of the land, if we remember from our hierarchy of laws uh, that we've gone over, uh, both in this course and elsewhere, but I'll bring it up again. But it's important to know that, you know, at least in terms of resources that those coastal states now, since 1953, have, you know, primary authority over the resources that exist uh, in those areas. So what are, the what are the policy implications of the Thailand's controversy? Point one, I think there are two major points here. Property rights are critical in establishing a foundation for policy development. Clear property rights create stability for policy development while unclear property rights lead to instability. When we look at that history and when you read about it and think about it, when we don't know exactly who, it's like the gold rush or a rush, when we don't know exactly who has prioritization and rights and where the, how those rights are divided. And we again, thinking about the actors from a public perspective, from the coastal state versus federal government perspective. So state government, federal government. When we don't know, when it isn't clearly defined, then you kind of have a rush. You have a rush to the bottom. Uh, you have people moving, you have governments trying to issue leases, um, trying to issue authorizations, and uh, just sort of running to try to take advantage of the situation. You think of individuals, um, when you don't have clearly defined uh, rights established by law, it can be problematic. And so that makes it difficult to establish clear policy, because it's just kind of a race where people are doing different things, and you don't really know exactly um, what would be allowed, and especially if there are competing things being done, which uh, which thing, which activity takes priority over the other. And that's really important to know from a policy standpoint is that property rights help create stability and stability is really important for, um, for policy uh, development. So once property rights are defined, a policy setting that is conducive to negotiation and cooperation is more likely options for collaboration increase. And we can think of the Submerged Lands Act, and we can also move forward from last, uh, the materials, uh, the pre most previous materials, the Coastal Zone Management Act. If we take those two laws, we know the Submerged Land Act clearly identifies that coastal states have ownership, priority, interest in, um, and unique in, um, unilateral uh, ownership interest in the resources that are contained in those three miles of coastal water. And that's important to know because then coastal states say, okay, we own it. We own those resources. So we have priority and we can, you can start from there, federal government or you know, other individuals, and they can start planning out exactly how coastal states want to manage those resources, want to prioritize. And then if we think of the Coastal Zone Management Act and overlay that or add that to the Submerged Lands Act, we can say, wow, that's, so now coastal states not only have at, you know, ownership over those resources, but they really have the authority to identify what are priorities in their planning process. So really think about policy here and, and planning out what are, what are our priorities, what's important to us, how are we gonna prioritize them? And then most importantly, maybe is, hey, federal government, whatever you're gonna to try to do in not only our waters, but the federal waters that are right next to our coastal waters or actions that might impact our coastal waters, you need to really think through federal consistency under the Coastal Zone Management Act. You really need to think about the implications because uh, federal consistency requires you to consider our priorities, our identified uh, priorities in the coastal areas. So 
That's point one. Point two, legal frameworks about the ownership and use of coastal and ocean resources is relatively new and evolving. Really important to know that, you know, uh, in a world where we're thinking about, you know, uh, how legal frameworks and property rights help us understand what policy options exist, that when, as we start moving off, uh, from dry land into the oceans, we're moving into an area that we really don't have a, a, a ton of history, a really long, uh, detailed history in terms of identifying and creating legal frameworks. They're relatively new and evolving. So if clearly defined property rights are critical, if we assume that they're critical to meaning policy development, then the relatively new and evolving understanding of coastal and ocean resource property rights means policy development is new and evolving. So we would expect have a lot of sort of historical understanding because of deep, long-standing historical legal frameworks on land that we have a really long history of policy development, and it's really defined and articulated. As we move offshore, we would expect, well, we don't have as much. Those legal frameworks aren't as long-standing. There's not as many of them, uh, so they're relatively new. So we would understand that policy development is the same. It's, it's newer, and there's less uh, development. So where we find less defined legal frameworks in ocean waters, the implication here, we will find less defined policy development. But because there's less defined existing policy development, there's also more room for new policy development. So that's really important to understand. If we think about, wow, what's going on in ocean waters, particularly um, not only near coastal waters, but as we move further and further off the coastline, what's happening out there? And um, what are the rules? that have existed there, um, and what are our options? We're going to say that as we move further and further offshore, there's not that much history of longstanding rules, at least rules that have been formalized into law, and therefore, there's probably not a ton of policy history, meaning that we would expect there to be less and less policy history to understand, less complication, and therefore, the flip side of that coin is there's a lot of ripe room for policy development. We can see this sort of uh, represented here um, in, in this uh, diagram here is that, look, we understand that legal framework definitions are going to be really high as in, at, they're going to be at their most defined here, they're the most numerous and most defined in the upland areas. As we move further and further off the water, we know that as from a continuum standpoint, the legal framework definition is going to decrease. So we know right, in private rights, public rights, you know, state, federal, so on and so forth. Now it's no, no more private rights, just public rights. If any private rights are going to be defined by leasing and that sort of thing, whatever the public allows for, whether it's recreational, fishing, for example, licensing, that sort of thing. So you can capture some fish. It's limited. We have direct control over that. Um, oil and gas, sure, you're a private company. You need to get a lease. You need to get a permit to do it. Uh, we authorize the permit, um, you know, that sort of thing. And then, oh, now we're into federal waters. Hey, federal permit, you know, um, the legal framework definition, generally speaking, will get less and less. Um, who has a say over things less and less. And then, the, therefore, the policy options. Um, not many policy options because super well-defined, maybe new policy or degrees of freedom because there's so many existing policies to consider. But as we move further and further offshore, there is more and more. That's what we would expect. That's what this dynamic suggests. In terms of offshore resource development, so with the settlement of the Tidelands controversy in 1953, the Submerged Lands Act, and the passage implementation of the Coastal Zone Management Act, 1972 and after, a higher degree of certainty of offshore resource ownership has occurred, but the question still remained about development, and we can consider these two things. Well, most importantly, we can consider the following. The role of technology in both resource identification and development potential. This includes finding new potential resources and being able to cap capture those resources. So what I mean by this is we can think of the ocean, and I, I said this at the beginning of it, we can think of the ocean as this place where there's not a lot of understanding, but our understanding is increasing. Historically, we've had very little understanding. You know, the, I, some of you might have heard that we know less about our deep oceans 
than we do about space, right? That we, you know, they're less explored <laughs> and they're less understood. Um, so the ocean creates this, you know, this, this high degree of opacity. We have that mirror effect where if we go on the ocean, we look down and if the sun's shining, we generally just see a reflection. We really don't get to see what's going on underneath. And we really have limited exploration of what's going on underneath. And that certainly um, holds truer and truer as we move further and further offshore. We know less about the deep waters of the middle of our oceans than we do about our near waters. Um, and that makes sense because we, again, we think of access, we think of capacity, we think of, you know, our ability to not only move offshore, but also to then access deeper and deeper water. It's, you know, only in more recent times have we been able to do it and our, the amount that we're doing is limited. We're not doing it a lot. There's, a, you know, a lot more going on in other areas than to understand what's going on. But as technology in both resource identification and development potential increases, um, then we can think about, you know, how that's going to change our way of thinking about resources. So within a foundation of property rights, state and federal governments, we think about the Submerged Lands Act and CZMA. So now we have property rights in place. Now we have that framework understanding. State and federal governments can then look to the development of those resources. Consider the role technology plays and how the term resources is defined in this context. As technology advances, the capacity to reach areas of the ocean becomes realized. As the capacity to reach areas of the ocean increases, the concept of what constitutes a resource can expand, the very definition of a resource. We have seen a corollary of this phenomenon terrestrially in recent years where advancements in the techniques used for extracting oil and gas, fracking, has increased the land-based production of oil and gas in the United States. Known reserves of oil and gas previously thought of as undevelopable, whether because of technological lim limitations or economic feasibility in relation to alternatives, has now become a viable resource due to technological advancements. The same is true of our ocean environment. A great number of potential resources exist in the oceans. Whether we identify these resources is really a matter of feasibility, a term that suggests a technological and economic capacity. As technology and economic factors advance, both coastal states and the federal government are continually evolving their understanding of the resources available to them in the marine environment. Sometimes the current definition and utilization of resources comes into conflict with other current and potential resource development. This is where we can um, direct our focus. So one way of saying that is right now, this framework, this idea that general, you know, generally the legal framework definition is much higher in upland areas and much lower. And as a result, as we said, the policy options or a degree of freedom is relatively low in upland areas and much higher as we move off waters. But as technology increases, as time, if we had a unit of time here that was moving in this direction, we would know that this would change, that our legal framework definition would start to alter. It would not be, it certainly would be high here, but the the degree of low would be much so if it was uh, if it was linear here like this, then maybe we would say that no, it would actually become more sort of um, parabolic. So we would move further and further in this direction before we started moving up over time because we're learning more and more. Um, our state waters over time will become better understood. Our nearshore waters better understood, more like what we understand dry land and the resources because of technological advancements, et cetera, and just our experience, and the, we'll understand more about it and utilization or in, and trade-offs between you know, using it for resources, uh, resource A versus resource B or use A versus use B. But the point is over time, it'll become more like our upland areas in terms of legal framework definition. The same will be said as time goes on to our territorial seas and even further as time goes on to our exclusive economic zones. It's very likely that we'll just increase, keep increasing our legal framework definition as our comfort and understanding of these areas increases. So it's really important to understand and know that. And as that happens, we'll start thinking about competing uses. It's no longer about whether we can access this place or access and capture a particular resource, it'll be like, we can do anything. We can do all the things that we want to do. Now it's a matter of what should we do, not can we do it, but whether should we do it, right? So should we do oil and gas extraction, for example, in an area where, you know, um, 
or in a time when maybe there's a problems associated with that, if they have an effect on other competing uses. And if it's about energy production, hey, we can also do offshore wind, for example, as a way of creating energy production. Is that a better, superior way to use these waters? We can start thinking about that. So if we think about offshore resource development, let's go ahead and sort of juxtapose this in terms of these uh, these these potential conflicts and let's look at the um, Offshore Continental uh, Shelves and Lands Act. So the, I'm sorry, the Outer Continental Shelves and Lands Act, which is a federal law. So it's a federal statute providing a framework for offshore resource development not related to commercial fishing. Again, you know, which is controlled by a, a, a different uh, statute. The public and private partnership nature of the statute. So what's important uh, to note is there's a relationship that is created between public and private partnerships under, think, under uh, OXLA uh, for the development of these resources, mainly oil and gas, but also increasingly for minerals as the technology improves, improves and the demand for rare earths increases, making the cost of marine extraction more feasible. Those polymetallic nodules, for example, that I told you about, I mentioned earlier. The main policy framework that exists for the extraction of these resources is one based on private enterprise seeking access to a public good. Um, if certain conditions are met, the private enterprise is given a lease under OXLA to access public land, you know, the ocean, and extract the public resource, say oil and gas. In consideration of this right to extract the resource, the private enterprise pays a fee to government for both the access and resource itself. The difference between the fee charged for access and extraction and the price paid for the commodity becomes the profit for the private enterprise, excluding all other costs for extraction and bringing the commodity to market. There's an issue of competing uses. So for example, um, in the energy field, there's improvements in technology that have allowed for the ocean to be a source of energy production in ways beyond oil and gas extraction. Wind turbines sited offshore offer opportunities for energy development due to the substantial source of wind in many offshore areas. The technology advancement in wind turbine design offers energy production with an input, wind, that is different from the historical source extraction, oil and gas. So we can think about, for example, whether it's energy production, wind, wind, wind or wave versus oil and gas. Now, again, we have a history of oil and gas. We've been doing that for a while offshore, you know, since the 30s, as we said, off of California, at least with oil, beginning with oil. And we've, you know, so we have almost 100 years of experience there, whereas more recently, we're really um, advanced what we call renewable because the source, the source of the wind, right? It's, you know, inexhaustible effectively and wave uh, as a result of gravity and wind uh, wave actions. Um, so we can think about these. They both help with energy production. One we've been doing for a while and one where is relatively nascent and new. One has problems attached to it, not only with the, in terms of, you know, when you have problems like the BP, um, you know, the deep, uh, Deep Horizon in 2010 in the Gulf of Mexico, Exxon Valdez, et cetera. There are, there are problems with extracting oil and gas because it can cause real um, significant problems to the ecosystem if you have leaks, for example. And there's also problems related to carbon. Uh, you know, the energy production when the wind and wave, generally speaking, are extremely low carbon to no carbon. Um, and if we think about climate change and we add that as a concern, as a consideration, as a warming planet is something that creates all kinds of externalities and problems we have to deal with, and then we can start thinking about, look, there's, you know, we're talking about energy production, but there's different ways we can use these quote unquote offshore resources to provide this energy production. It's really important to think about those, the issue of competing uses. And in terms of resource utilization, like I said, you know, commercial fishing versus oil and gas and the deep horizon being a, an example. So, and also, by the way, as um, tourism, the impact on tourism uh, when you have an oil spill and that sort of thing. So we can think about these, uh, these examples bring us back to our earlier exploration of competing uses of marine resources leading to conflicts between user groups. So if we think about competing uses. So we can go, we can look at Oxla versus the Coastal Zone Management Act, climate change and sea level rise example. So we can focus on this specifically. We have two federal laws here, Ox, the outer, um, you know, Oxla for offshore oil and gas leasing, mainly at the federal level, and the Coastal Zone Management Act. Um, which is incentivizing, right, a federal law. So we have federal law one versus federal law two. 
uh, another federal law that incentivizes CZMA, coastal states to develop coastal management plans and then to implement those plans, which is, hey, let's have uniform priorities amongst the states about how they want to go about identifying what's important in the use of their coastal zone and then actually doing that, actually uh, implementing those policy statements. So we have our OXLA, uh, the Development of Offshore Oil and Gas Resources, and the Coastal Zone Management Act, which is to prioritize coastal landscape and ecosystem uh, integrity. Let's look at that as being the sort of the, the juxtaposition here. So, um, you know, the CZMA, this prioritiz prioritization of coastal landscape and ecosystem integrity is part of sea level rise adaptation planning. So most coastal states, particularly now, they really care about uh, the effects of sea level rise because they have, um, they've been having an effect on uh, existing uh, planned development and also their coastal ecosystems. Um, they're losing coastal ecosystem integrity and they're losing, um, you know, not only the opportunity to develop in, in near shore areas, but also existing development in near shore areas. Is. Um, and so that's pretty significant. Now there's a reading um, that you have in the materials, and here's a link to that reading uh, for those that don't have the materials or just a separate link. Um, but you can go here, and I'll try to bring the link up on the video itself so you can have a direct link, but there it is. Um, my 2012 reading uh, is helpful um, because it helps us understand these competing uses at the federal level, this OXLA versus CZMA and how they create this sort of inherent conflict about um, what, is re what is an offshore resource? And then if we want to prioritize development, what happens when the federal government is prioritizing something that has a direct impact on uh, state uh, development and they're both federal laws. So prioritizing a federal policy, offshore oil and gas development leads to a direct conflict with policy preferences, the CZMA and their uh, desire for many coastal states to limit sea level rise, the effects of sea level rise. From our previous lecture, video lecture, you might remember um, this, uh, talking about the Coastal Zone Management Act in particular, but we can see this also provides us an understanding of this, uh, these OXLA versus CZMA issue, which is where you have coastal states that have adjacent coastal states, they have their different priorities. Um, we'll say these are just their, you know, their, their highest priorities. Coast State A, tourism, it's really all about tourism. Coast State B likes oil and gas development. That's something they've been doing. And Coastal State C has a thriving uh, commercial fishing. Uh, so these are their stated, you know, sort of number one priorities in each coastal state, and they're different from one another. And they share space. And of course, they have their three mile jurisdiction. Uh, and then you have the federal government. And we remember the federal government wants to do something like, let's say it's oil and gas leasing. And what the Coastal Zone Management Act, assuming the states have gone through the process of getting approved coastal management plans, they get funding for that. We understand that. And they also get federal consistency. And federal consistency is incredibly important because if we're talking about two federal laws, um, usually, um, they're in, you know the, the laws are equal to one another. And this is OXLA and the Coastal Zone Management Act, but the Coastal Zone Management Act has federal consistency in it. So it says, look, if you want to do this in federal waters, it's going to have an impact on our state waters. It has the likelihood to have an impact on our state waters. So you really need to consider that impact. Now, it might be harmonious with Coastal State B, the plan, the federal government plan, it might not, but it might be harmonious because they're both oil and gas, but even so, it still might not be harmonious. Uh, but certainly tourism, it can have an impact on tourism for coastal state A and fishing for coastal state C. So effectively, what if you remember what this says is that this the Coastal Zone Management, Management Act gives these coastal states a seat at the table within federal waters when the federal government wants to do something like prioritize oil and gas leasing under OXLA, uh, under a federal law as a mechanism for realizing some of the resources in federal waters. As far as final thoughts are considered regarding all of these materials. What we can remember from this is, look, policy can get messy, even when the laws seem clear. So even when we have federal laws, like OXLA and the CZMA. They're both federal laws and they're equal under our hierarchy of laws. They both exist here at the federal level. They're under our laws. Um, but the CZMA has federal consistency requirement and we can consider the impl implications of that. What we're saying here, for example, is that look, we're now moving forward in time. We're in an interesting time where we have technology advancing relatively quickly. 
comparison to historical standards, human historical standards. And that technology is allowing us more and more options. And particularly, we can think of renewable energy, offshore renewable energy development, if we're just thinking about energy. Because, look, if it, be, if it becomes cheaper to use offshore wind, for example, and maybe tidal and some others as a mechanism to create energy production, then that resource of wind, offshore wind, as a resource, is more valued than oil and gas, offshore oil and gas, particularly if we start including the cost of carbon in that oil and gas process relative to sea level rise and the effects of climate change. So the point is, even though oil and gas, offshore oil and gas is a resource, it might move its way in terms of prioritization back to a point where it is undesirable. It's something we don't want, we don't need, it's, it's just unimportant to us because we've moved beyond it. We've moved to another alternative resource in our offshore uh, areas, and if it's wind, that sort of thing, um, where the benefits are just so much higher. If it's cheaper to produce the thing we want, if it doesn't have the externalities uh, that come with oil and gas, whether that's carbon for climate change or whether it's the mess that it cre create during spills, ecosystem issues, the killing off of target fish species, so on and so forth, the destruction of coastal habitat, nursery habitat for commercial target fish species, so on and so forth. So we can think, look, policy is messy, but these legal frameworks really help us understand in a world where our, our options are changing because of technology, our choices, our consideration of choices, which is all about policy. What can we do, right? The technology helps us understand what can we do, and then that informs the next policy question was what should we be doing? And so policy is messy in that way because it requires consideration of variables that are changing, that are evolving over time. But when we look at the legal frameworks, we can say, great, these legal frameworks are helpful because they help us give definition. We know under the Coastal Zone Management Act, we certainly know under the Submerged Lands Act, that coastal states have a seat at the table. They have a right in coastal waters. They have a right to the resources in coastal waters. It's not an absolute right, but they have a right. We know this, and we all certainly know the federal government has rights as competing, remember, we're only looking at these public actors, we're moving offshore, public resources. So we have state and federal actors that both have rights clearly defined at this point, much more defined than they were before 1953. And we have the Coastal Zone Management Act 1972 moving forward that helps give us even further definition. Those laws help us understand who the players are, what are the rules that define the relationships between the players, and what advantages they might have if we think about it as a, a, a board game. We have, we have clearly defined rules and those laws have helped us understand what those rules are. They don't define every instance, they don't answer every question, but they give us definition. Through that definition of those legal frameworks, we then understand policy options better. We understand where there are levers, where there are points of agreement, and when there are disagreements, who has authority to you know, to push their perspective over the other. That's where these things help. So we can think about the OXLA, the Submerged Lands Act, the Coastal Zone Management Act as ways in which we can understand the policy implications in this sort of larger policy field. And then we can also think about other federal laws that can help identify policy direction through prioritization. And here I just identify the National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA. We don't get into it in great detail in this course. We do in the environmental law course. Uh, NEPA is incredibly important, a little bit in administrative law as well, but mostly in environmental law, because the National Environmental Policy Act requires for any major federal action, it includes offshore leasing as a matter of giving a lease prior to doing that, the federal government must consider the, um, the environmental impacts, the potential environmental impacts before it engages or allows the activity to occur. And as we, as our understanding of the world and interactions increases, um, we can think of um, the environmental impacts to include climate change. So it's like NEPA helps us see or prioritize because what NEPA says is, look, you need to consider all of the environmental impacts uh, and so what are environmental impacts? Is carbon, is moving carbon now under climate change an environmental impact? Before climate change, before we thought of climate change, before we understood the dynamics of climate change, moving carbon probably wouldn't be considered an environmental impact. But now it is. And is it a significant impact? Because if it is a significant impact, 
moving carbon, if we define it now as a significant impact, under NEPA, we must consider alternatives. And that includes the no action alternative. And in this case, as technology has allowed us to understand there are alternatives before wind, if, before we could harness wind the way we can now, before we could harness wave activity for energy production the way we can now, before we could do that, they were not alternatives for energy production, offshore use of energy production, but now they are. So that changes the question. It changes the context in which we go through a NEPA analysis. Are there alternatives? Are there less significant, impactful ways to achieve the outcome? So if it's all about energy production, federal government, is oil and gas offshore leasing the best way to go about that? Does it have environmental impacts? Are those environmental impacts significant? And if so, are there alternatives? Are there less significant means, aka are there means that does not move carbon from one place and put it into another to increase the effects of climate change? And are those alternatives viable, right? So NEPA forces us to go through this process so we can think about other laws like NEPA and how they further overlay to give us an understanding of what it means to develop policy in this world of, 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 of better understanding of things like climate change, carpet forcing, that sort of thing. So what is an offshore resource? What are competing resources in offshore areas? And you know how, how policy can help, how these legal frameworks help us come to a decision-making process through a policy framework. So policy can get messy even when the law seems clear because there's all of this sort of dynamic that still occurs within the policy decision-making process. But remember the overarching goal. We're understanding how legal frameworks help to define ocean law and policy space, generally speaking, how they help us understand, like I said, who are the players, what are the rules, and how do we make decisions under those rules with those players. And consider the larger policy questions and seek to understand how legal frameworks help to shape those questions and possible solutions. Just like I was saying, NEPA, for example, helps us shape a policy question as to, geez, what's better if it's all about energy production, putting all of those other concerns about what other things we do on the ocean, if it's just about producing energy, you know, is moving carbon the best way to do it now that we have other means and other mechanisms in order to create energy using quote unquote offshore resources. So think about that in terms of understanding the larger picture from the policy perspective. What's the purpose of these laws? How do we then understand these laws and how do we turn them into frameworks for understanding policy options, both what we do, what we can do, and what we should do? Thank you.